What's up, everybody? Mr. Forrest back with another episode of Big Truths. Guys, this is Big Truths 36. That means there have been 35 Big Truths so far. Some of you have been along for the entire ride. If you've been watching the whole time for all 35 Big Truths up to this point, can you comment down the down below all 35? Guys, I'm proud of you. Thanks for being with me along for the ride. I'm super excited uh, for today because we're going to be talking about a really important word. And that really important word is grace. Do you know what grace is? Well, you're about to find out. And you're about to find out what happened to Mike. Let's jump right into it. Guys, you remember a few weeks back, Mike and Ed and Steve were at the 7-Eleven. They were eating Big Bites and they were drinking Slurpees. Remember, they were sitting on the curb outside and Stead, as Mike called Steve and Ed, were explaining the gospel to him, and they were sharing with him what they were learning from the book of Ezekiel in Mr. Klitzing's class. Now, you guys might remember this, but do you remember how the people of Judah were captives in Babylon? And you remember they kept worshiping idols and sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning? Sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning. And God promised them, I'm going to take you back to the land and renew the land. I'm going to give you a new shepherd leader, and the temple's going to be rebuilt. But you know, that wasn't enough, because even when they got back to the land and the temple was rebuilt, they kept sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning. Sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning. And God said, it's like you have a heart of stone, but I'm going to give you a soft, brand new heart of flesh, and then you'll be able to obey me. And he was referring to the new covenant. You guys remember that Mike needed a heart transplant. He was ill. His actual heart, the muscle inside his chest, wasn't working right, and he needed a new one. And you guys remember that just as Mike started understanding the gospel, his eyes got wide, he dropped his big bite, his hands clutched his chest, and he fell down to the pavement. Remember that Steve and Ed looked at each other in a moment of panic? And then Steve stayed with Mike, and Ed ran inside the 7-Eleven to call 911 because Mike needed an ambulance. Mike needed to get to a hospital ASAP. You guys want to find out what happens to Mike? Sit up super straight, and I'll tell you. Mike Ferguson felt like he deserved God's salvation. In fact, he felt like he deserved every good thing that came into his life. Mike was tall. Mike was strong. Mike was handsome. And Mike was popular. All the girls thought of him as a big teddy bear, and they always wanted to give him a hug. All the boys wanted to be like him because he was so good at sports, and he was so good at football that everybody took notice. In fact, coaches from all around took notice, and they would send him free shoes to try to get him to attend their camp. The trainers would always give him free KT tape and free braces, and basically whatever he needed for football, they'd give it to him for free. Schools in the area, private schools, would offer him a scholarship to pay for his schooling if they, he would come to their school to play football. He had to keep his grades up to a certain level in order to stay eligible to play football. So kids in his class would let him copy off their tests during an exam. Some kids would do his daily assignments for him. Even some teachers would give him a better grade than he deserved. And all of that stuff, Mike felt like he deserved it. Even when some random good thing would happen to him, he felt like he deserved it. Like the time where the school did a raffle. So the whole school participated in this raffle. And every kid got to write their name and phone number on a piece of paper, then fold it in half, and then drop it in this big glass bowl. And at the end of the week, Mr. Rollmall or the principal would reach inside and pull out one name, and that was the person who'd win the bike. So sure enough, Friday after school, uh, assembly time, Mr. Romar reached inside. He pulled out one name from the glass bowl after stirring it and stirring it and stirring it. And the name he read was Mike. Mike came up to the front and the kids cheered and Mike smiled, but he wasn't surprised. He felt like he deserved that bike. 
On his birthday and on Christmas, his grandmother would send him a card with some money in it, and uh, a check in it, rather, and Mike would never read the card. He'd tear it open, just throw the card away, and he'd take that check to the bank as soon as he could, and he would uh, cash that check so he'd have the money. And he felt like he deserved that money. Mike was a religious kid, and sometimes he'd go to church, and at church he heard that Jesus died on the cross. He even heard that Jesus died for his sins, but Mike kind of felt like he deserved it for Jesus to die for his sins. But none of that was going on in his mind right now. Right now, Mike was in a an ambulance laying on a gurney headed to the hospital. And like the ambulance was racing down the street, his mind was racing and he was asking questions like, is this it? Is this the end? Am I going to die? If I do die, am I going to go to heaven? And Mike thought, of course I'll go to heaven. Everybody else likes me. Surely God likes me. Plus I go to church sometimes and I do a lot of good things. I probably deserve to go to heaven. Boy, was Mike wrong. Within minutes, the ambulance pulled into the hospital and the medics had Mike wheeling as fast as they could into the hospital before he knew it. Within a matter of minutes, he was hooked up to these machines and he was in the operating room and he could hear the chatter of the doctors and the beeping of the machines. And the last thing that Mike remembered seeing was a team of doctors looking down at him wearing masks. And then the anesthesia kicked in and Mike fell asleep. Mike needed a heart transplant. And something very fortunate happened. They just so happened to get a donor heart. Now, it was an adult donor heart, but Mike was so big, it was the perfect size for him. The surgery lasted a very long time. And the whole time, Steve and Ed and Sheila were nervously pacing in the waiting room. Steve and Ed were praying. Sheila was chewing her fingernails. Mike's parents were waiting in the recovery area. And finally, after a very long time, the first thing Mike remembered was waking up in the recovery room. He was groggy. He was disoriented. He didn't know what was going on. As soon as his parents saw him waking up, they ran into the waiting room and they told Steve and Ed and Sheila that the surgery had been successful. And the kids high-fived and hugged and cheered and Steve and Ed thanked God. But it would be several days before Mike could receive visitors. But as soon as he could receive visitors, Steve and Ed, uh, well, Sheila went as often as she could, but Steve and Ed went every single day. But before they went in, they'd had to like wash like before entering the room and then put this cap on and this mask on and then they had to put these gloves on and this gown on you see the surgeon didn't want mike getting any kind of infection and so he didn't want any germs coming in so the kids had to wash up and wear this protective gear but they were just happy to see mike and they went in and they saw that mike was on a ventilator he couldn't breathe on his own so he needed a ventilator to help him because he had that ventilator he couldn't speak but he could listen, and he did a lot of listening over the next few weeks. Every day, Stephen and Ed would come in, and they would read him the Bible. And Mike liked it for a while. That is, until they got to the book of Ephesians. See, Stephen and Ed knew that Mike thought he deserved every good thing that came his way. Mike even felt like he deserved that new heart that the donor had given him. And this is sad and kind of disturbing. Mike secretly felt like he deserved that heart more than the person who had it before him. And so when Stephen Ed began reading the book of Ephesians, and when they read chapters 1 and 2, it offended Mike and kind of made him mad. But there was nothing he could do about it. He was laying in a hospital bed, so they kept reading. Listen to part of what they read. Ephesians 1, 5 through 8. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself, as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of, the glor of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved One. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. You see, Mike thought he deserved God's love. 
Mike felt like he deserved God's blessings. Mike felt like he deserved to go to heaven. But the Bible teaches that God chose to love us even though we don't deserve it. Deserve it. God chose to bless us even though we don't deserve it. God chose to save us even though we don't deserve it. In fact, the complete opposite is true. What we actually deserve is death and eternal separation from God. We deserve God's judgment because of our sins. We deserve God's punishment because of our sins. We actually have undeserved it. We have actually de-earned it. So if that's the case, why would God choose to love us? Why would God choose to save us? Why would God choose to bless us? The answer is our very important word. Grace. Grace means God giving us what we do not deserve. But going even further, God giving us what we've actually de-earned, unearned, what we actually undeserved. Because of his grace, God chose to love us. It makes him happy. God chose to save us. It makes us. It makes him happy. It's just because God is good. And there's nothing we've done to earn it or deserve it. We've actually done the complete opposite and de-earned it and undeserved it. Out of a heart of love, God chooses sinners to bring into a relationship with himself. And nobody understood that better than Ed. We talked about it a little bit last week, but Ed was uh, adopted. You guys remember that? So before he was adopted, he had a terrible lifestyle. He lived in a tiny apartment that smelled like stale beer and cigarette smoke. Ed's dad spent all his money on alcohol and Ed's mom spent all her money on drugs. Ed didn't even have a bed to sleep on, so he'd throw a blanket on the floor in the living room and he slept on the floor in the living room. He didn't always go to school because his parents didn't make him go to school. When he did go to school, his hair would be disheveled and there'd be dirt on his face and his clothes were all raggedy. And sometimes he'd go to school, he didn't even have a lunch. But everything changed when the Johnsons adopted him. Ed now lived in a house. Guys, Ed had his own room, his own skateboard, his own bike. Ed had clothes that were clean and he took baths and he went to school every day. And when he did go to school, he had nutritious lunches. He had a family who actually loved him and protected him. And so Ed understood this concept of grace. Ed would never forget the day that the Mr. and Mrs. Johnson adopted him. He had nothing to give back. He had nothing to offer them. But they chose to love this dirty, funny-smelling, funny-looking, funny-acting kid who had nothing to give back to them. They chose him. They chose to love him and bring them into their home and make him their own son. That's what grace is. See, we have to understand that the only things we earn, the only things we deserve are death and eternal separation from God. We deserve God's judgment. We deserve God's punishment. But because God is so good, Ephesians 1 says that God is rich in grace and he pours it on sinners. God's so good, he chooses to love us. He chooses to save us. And it's all because of his grace. Mike was going to have a six-week recovery time. That's a lot of time to think. That's a lot of time for God to work in his heart. And believe me, God was at work. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Big Truths. We actually have a couple new Big Truth questions for you. Now, you guys will remember last week and, and for several weeks, it was who was the Holy Spirit, the comforter and companion of every believer. Well, this week we have two new questions. And our questions are, what does it mean to be saved? And here's how I want you to remember it. It means to be rescued from my sin and have a relationship with God. Let's say that together. It means to be rescued from my sin and have a relationship with God. So this is sign language for save or rescue. 
You guys will remember because of our sin, we're separated from God. But when God rescues us from our sin, he also brings us back into a relationship with him. So we're no longer separated from him. So what does it mean to be saved? Say it with me. To be rescued from my sin and have a relationship with God. Then the next question is, how is someone saved? The answer, by repenting and believing on Jesus. Let's say that together. How is someone saved? By repenting and believing on Jesus. So in future episodes, we're going to talk about what those words mean. Salvation, repent, believe. For now, I just want you guys to remember the questions and the answers. We're going to work on them more. We're going to learn a lot more. And I am so excited about it. So don't miss an episode of Big Truths. Our memory verse this week is Ephesians 1.5. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Guys, don't forget to hit this video with a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Don't forget to stay tuned for next week's Big Truth. Until then, I'll see you guys next time. Mr. Forrest out.